Hello, uh, welcome back to the seasonal eating at Mount Vernon series. Um, this is the third installment on summer. You can check out the earlier installments on mountvernon.org slash videos. My name is Sarah Marie Massey. I'm the manager of Historic Trades. And uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about um, seasonal eating. And just a quick note, um, most of the images in this, in this presentation have been cited. Um, if they're not cited, it's because I either took the photograph myself or um, I pulled it from Mount Vernon's internal library of images um, taken by our media department. Um, so what are we gonna talk about this, this session? We're gonna look a little bit at um, what summer meant as a season for the people living here at Mount Vernon, um, what crops were available to be harvested, how that plays out in an 18th century menu. Uh, we're gonna, going to get into some preservation techniques that were available. Uh, we're also going to talk about some special treats that um, the Washington family would enjoy during the summer. And then we'll talk a little bit about how um, summer dining would be for the enslaved people here. Um, and so let's just jump right in. Um, last, you know, in the last session, you know, when we were talking about spring, um, I mentioned that that spring would be a bit of a difficult season, um, particularly for the enslaved people, because everything that was planted in the early spring uh, would not have been ready to harvest until very, very end of the season. Uh, and a lot of the winter stores would be running low. The summer was a season of bounty. Um, summer and fall are the times of year when we have the, the greatest production. Um, our modern horticulture department harvests 28 different um, crops in the month of July, for example. Um, that's only September has an equal number of crops that are being harvested that time of year. Uh, and of course, thing, the climate was slightly different in the 18th century, so um, the seasons may have been slightly off, but you can, this is a, it's a good rule of thumb guide um, that things were probably pretty similar here at, at Mount Vernon in Washington's time. Um, and this is backed up by the gardening manuals that exist that were written in the 18th century, you know, when you, and, and the cookbooks of the time as well. So you, when you look at what was available, um, it more or less lines up. Um, that said, having this bounty of food um, means that you had this responsibility to preserve all of that food um, because winter and more importantly, the, the early spring were coming when um, shortages would occur. Um, and so the only way to combat that would be to keep what you had. Um, and so we'll come back to this later in the in the session. Um, what would be growing and available in the spring? Um, the, the, or sorry, in the summertime, um, this would be the end of the season for salad greens. Um, salad greens don't really like hot weather. Those of you who have been outdoors here in, in the DC region uh, have noticed that it's been a very hot summer. Um, and so, you know, salad greens either die off as the weather gets hotter or they bolt, which means they start to flower. And when that happens, they turn bitter. They're not enjoyable to eat. Um, other spring vegetables, you'd have them in the early part of the summer, um, you know, peas, broccoli, cauliflower, radishes, asparagus. Uh, we also talked last session about coleworts, things like um, uh, collards and kale and stuff like that. Um, so it would be kind of the end of that season as well. Um, they do best in cold weather. Uh, and, and so you you would be harvesting in the first month or so of, of summer, but um, by the end of, uh, you know, by August, you're not gonna have those available. Um, a lot of root vegetables are, are harvested in summer. Um, so, you know, you're gonna have things like potatoes, carrots, onions, That's the, this is the height of the time of year when you're harvesting them. Um, and they're, they're good preservers. And so you will, would have them available then throughout the rest of the year stored in a root cellar. Um, the summer is the height of the season for beans. We're talking both green beans for eating fresh and beans for drying to save into the winter. Um, artichokes, one of the biggest highlights of the summer season would be berries and stone fruit. Um, so that's one of the most distinctive aspects of the diet in this time of year. Um, cucumbers, melons, eggplants, 
And of course, we've been talking about all of this wonderful produce, but summer is also the height of the, the agricultural harvesting season um, when it comes to the grains that George Washington was making his money off of uh, and that were feeding the estate. So wheat as his primary cash crop, you know, it's typically harvested in um, mid to late June. Uh, corn would be harvested in, in July, August, um, you know, uh, barley, rye, oats, they have kind of a similar harvest to wheat. Um, dairy production would also be at its peak in the summer because this is the time of year when the grass is the, the most dense and, and nutrient rich. Um, so how does this play out in an 18th century menu? Um, this is a bill of fare for June. Um, and you can see that there are numerous fresh fruits and vegetables available on this menu. I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna start with the first course. Uh, so we've got cauliflower, broad beans, which are a type of green bean, um, parsley butter. We have summer cabbage, we have French beans. Um, the second course, you know, cherry tart, artichoke suckers. Um, so suckers are basically side shoots. And today uh, we, we typically go for just the, the central shoot when we're harvesting artichokes because they're bigger. Um, but in the 18th century, they're going to harvest everything so that they have more available. And so they're going to have the suckers as well as the main shoot. Um, peas and then currant and raspberry tart. Um, but remember, if you are, you know, you have we have all of these fresh vegetables that are and fruits that are showing up on the table of wealthy people like the Washingtons. But in the background, um, there's going to be all of this preservation that's happening so that later in the year um, there would be something to eat. And you'll notice that um, that I have, uh, you know, an artichoke here um, rather than uh, you know, rather than a, a pickle, we tend to think about pickling as being something that um, is just for cucumbers. Um, but as you'll see, that that was not at all the case in the 18th century. Um, so what what is pickling? Well, it is preservation with salt and vinegar. And typically, um, you're taking fruits or vegetables, you are blanching them, meaning that you're boiling them for a very short period, um, really just to kind of take the the edge off, um, and then you are putting them into a salt and vinegar brine. And the reason that this works is that both salt and vinegar have um, antibacterial properties. Um, vinegar also has some antifungal activities or, or properties, I should say. Um, and so, so that's how that, that works. And, you know, artichokes were often pickled. You see many, many recipes in 18th century cookbooks for pickled artichokes. And apparently fresh artichokes were um, Martha Washington's favorite vegetable. Um, all right, so um, here is actually a recipe for, um, you know, pickling cauliflowers. Uh, this is from Hannah Glass, The Art of Cookery Made, made Plain and Easy. Um, and so I'll read it briefly for you um, just to get another sense of you know, the kinds of pickle recipes. They, they're actually, it's the, this recipe is remarkably similar to modern recipes. It's just that today we don't tend to think about pickling cauliflower. Um, but take the largest and finest cauliflower that you can get, um, cut them in little pieces, or more properly, hold them uh, into a stew pan on the fire with spring water. And when it boils, put in your flowers with a good handful of white salt and just let them boil up very quick. Uh, be sure you don't let them boil above one minute. So this is the blanching process that I was talking about. Um, then take them out uh, with a broad slice and lay them on a cloth and cover them with another cloth uh, and, and let them lie till they are quite cold. Then, in, then put in your, your wide mouth bottles with two or three blades of mace in each bottle and a nutmeg sliced uh, in vinegar thin. And then fill up your bottles with distilled vinegar and cover them over with mutton fat, and over that a bladder, and then a leather. Um, let them stand a month before you open them, and if you find the, the pickle taste sweet, as maybe it will, um, pour off the vinegar and put fresh in. The spice will do again, uh, meaning you don't have to add more spice. Um, in a fortnight, they will be fit to eat. 
observe to throw them out of the boiling water into cold and then dry them. All right, so um, like I said, it's remarkably similar to a modern pickle recipe. You blanch the, the, the vegetable um, with or without salt, and then you put them in with spices and, and vinegar um, into you know, this bottle. Um, and the, the longer that you leave it, the, the sharper it will be, the more, the more pickly the pickle will be. Um, so I have here a list of some of the types of things that people pickled. Um, I'm not going to go through this list in exhaustive detail. You can, you can read through it briefly here yourself. Um, but I did want to point out that, you know, they're, they were pickling so many more things than we do today. Um, and again, this is because they're having to preserve a lot more. We pick, we make pickles because we enjoy them. They made pickles because they had to. So some of the, the types of things that are, are a little bit strange to our modern sensibilities, um, they're pickling a lot of fruits. Um, you know, apricots are the first thing on the list. Um, they're pickling a much wider variety of vegetables than we do. Um, they're pickling things like mushrooms. Um, they're also doing pickling flowers and flower buds, uh, radish pods, you know, um, nasturtium buds. So, you know, just just a really interesting variety. And this list was taken. Um, this was just like a brief sampling that I took from two 18th century cookbooks. So it's by no means exhaustive, uh, but it does give you a good sense of what types of things were being pickled. Um, so we've been talking quite a bit about uh, pickling, but another uh, preservation technique that, that would have been central to the activity in the kitchen here at Mount Vernon during the summer was making sweet preserves. And, um, you know, we tend to think about sweet preserves as just jelly and jam. Um, they're gonna be doing much more than we are. Um, I did want to point out here, uh, we know for, I, I, I chose the pictures um, because we know that the Washingtons grew cherries. We have um, written references to them. And on the left, that's actually a photograph I, I've taken of real pit, pit or um, uh, cherry pits that were found in an archaeological dig at the blacksmith shop. So we know that it's, it's a fruit that was being consumed here at Mount Vernon. Um, and what's surprising about this is not just, you know, it's it's not so much that they're um, doing sweet preserves of things that we wouldn't expect, because uh, a lot of what they're preserving with sweet, with sweet preservation methods is kind of similar to what we anticipate today. It's mostly fruits. Um, what is different about this is that they're using a much wider range of sweet pres preservation techniques than we think about. Um, so, like I, I said, we tend to focus today on jam, jelly, you know, marmalade, things like that. But they're also making dried fruits. Um, much more common than jam and jelly are actually preserves, which are whole fruit, fruit in syrup. Um, conserves tend to be fairly similar to preserves. Um, the definition of the two is is. A, a little hard to distinguish, distinguish in the 18th century. The, the terms are somewhat interchangeable. Um, candied fruit and flowers show up quite a bit. You see quite a few recipes for syrups, um, you know, so lavender syrup or, um, uh, you know, like a cherry syrup. Um, and then actually making wine, brandy and flavored liqueurs is actually, that's another preservation technique. Um, and we know that peach brandy was being made here at Mount Vernon. Um, so again, I'm focusing on uh, things that were actually being consumed on the estate. Um, and and the, the peach pits that you see in the image on the right are um, ones that were dug up uh, at, at the distillery. So those are from one of the peach brandy runs that was done here in the 1790s. Um, one thing that I did want to point out uh, you know, the mason jar, which is so pervasive today, was not invented until 1857. And so there, they had to use different techniques for um, sealing up their pickles and preserves in the 18th century. I'm going to back up a little bit and, and go back to um, the recipe for the pickled cauliflower. Um, 
So let me read that last little bit uh, to, to focus on how they were, were closing up the, the, the pickled cauliflowers. Um, so then fill them up, with, sorry, then fill up your bottle with distilled vinegar and cover them with mutton fat. So fat um, seals out air. And if you have cooked the fat so that you have removed all of the meat, you strain out any, it's called cracklings. You end up with these, um, you know, little, little bits of meat. If you strain all of them that out, um, the meat actually, or, or sorry, the fat actually becomes pretty darn um, shelf stable. It just doesn't spoil. And so um, covering with fat is a great thing, a great way to go. Um, then cover with a bladder. Um, we are talking about a real bladder, most likely a calf bladder, but possibly, you know, sheep or whatever, whatever animal you had slaughtered. Um, bladders are, are um, stretchy. So they, they fit over the mouth of a, a vessel very well, a jar, you know, a, a very well. Um, and you can tie them down. And again, they're airproof. Um, and then cover it with a leather. So you're being like extra sure that that it doesn't, um, you're, you're not getting any contamination from, uh, you know, bacteria getting through any of that or, or things falling into the jar or anything like that, dust. Um, so I'm going to move forward again. Um, right. <laughs> and then um, I have two other recipes here uh, to show you other ways that they were sealing things up. Um, the first recipe is from, uh, it, it's from um, uh, Amelia Simmons, and she wrote uh, American Cooking, Cookery, which was first published in 1797. Um, she's actually the first um, American cookbook published in America. Um, and so she has this recipe for, for pickling cucumbers, and she writes, um, put them into jars, Stive them down close. Stive means to like pack them tight um, and, and kind of push them down. Um, and when cold, tie on a bladder and a leather. So again, using, using things that were available to you to seal them as, as much as possible. Um, the second recipe is from Hannah Glass. We've already talked a bit about her. Um, it's to conserve red roses or any other flowers. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see it says, then put it, put it into galley pots. Um, so galley pots were um, typically a, a, a type of ceramic. Um, usually it, it was a clay ceramic um, and they were used as basically storage pots for different types of sweet and, and, and pickled preserves. Um, so tie it over with paper. They typically specify white paper and over that a leather and it will keep for seven years, right? Um, so one of the, the, the delights of summer for us these days is eating um, ice cream. You know, what is better than going out on a summer day and eating ice cream? Um, and that was true in the 18th century as well. Actually, let me back up. I realized there was something I forgot to talk about um, when I was mentioning the, when I was talking about the pickles and the preserves. Um, pickles and preserves were something that would be solely for um, the Washingtons and perhaps the, the hired white workers on the estate, these are not techniques that the enslaved people would have had access to. Um, and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that um, preserving with, with pickling, you know, preserving with vinegar um, and preserving with sugar were not um, methods that were being used in Africa at the time. So these wouldn't have been part of the, the, um, food traditions of the enslaved people. Um, and then also the, the ingredients would have been incredibly expensive for the enslaved people to acquire. Um, I'm not saying that they never were able to acquire sugar, um, but it certainly is not something that's being provided as part of their rations. Um, and, and so, and, and actually same thing with, with vinegar, the vinegar wasn't quite as expensive. Sugar is, is by far the most, um, one of the most expensive things that you bought in the 18th century. Um, but it's it's not something that they would have had access to on a regular basis. Now in the 19th century, that changes. And so um, you actually see, you know, this huge explosion of um, 
you know, jams and jellies and, and all of that. And of, of course, in, in the 19th century, when those ingredients become a little bit cheaper and it's easier for enslaved people for them to obtain them, um, then doing their own preservation becomes a way of having access to more food, you know, because if they're growing it themselves, um, then they're not having to buy it. Um, and, and so, you know, today, uh, these preservation techniques are central to Southern cooking and, and to African-American food traditions. But in the 18th century, they would not have been part of the, the diet of the enslaved. All right, so let's go back now and talk a little bit about ice cream and, and cold things. Um, so this is another treat that would be enjoyed exclusively by the, the wealthy on the estate. Um, and so I have on the left-hand side um, another bill of fare. Um, this one, is, we have July and August, but specifically for July in, in the second course that lists jellies and cold things. So what are jellies and cold things? We're not actually talking about like, like you know, strawberry jelly or whatever in, in this instance. There's actually a whole category of um, desserts in, in the 18th century called jellies. Um, think of it more like jello. Um, and these were being made initially with um, isinglass, which, which is uh, coming from a, a blowfish. It's, it's an inner part of the blowfish um, and it creates a gelatin. Um, they were also being made with heart's horn, uh, which is a gelatin that's extracted from the horn of a, a male deer. Um, you know, so those are, are what the early jelly recipes uh, were, were made from. And they were, they were flavored with fruit. They were flavored with wine. They're flavored with sugar, um, different kinds of things. Over time, um, the jellies would have been flavored or they would have been made, um, the gelatin would have been made instead with um, calves hoofs, you know, cow hoofs. So that becomes more common. But in any case, you know, whatever the, the gelatin is deriving from, um, these jellies were a way of showing off. Um, they were often dyed with, um, with natural food dyes, uh, things like spinach juice or, um, or uh, uh, cochineal, which is, uh, a, well, it's a, it's a beetle, um, but it was being used to dye clothing and, and to dye food. Um, it is actually food safe. Um, and oftentimes um, they would be served in these jelly glasses. This is actually a jelly glass that is from Mount Vernon's collection. Um, and they would be done in these layers. And so you would have this beautiful, um, you know, layered dessert with different flavors of, and colors of jelly um, going through it. And sometimes they were done also, uh, not just it, it poured into the glasses, but they would be poured into these fanciful molds and then cut at the table. Um, but obviously the most, the, the, the uh, cold dessert that we relate to the most is ice cream. And uh, we know that the Washingtons were very fond of ice cream. Um, they seem to have been introduced to ice cream in the 1740s, the late 1740s. Um, they attended a, a dinner served um, in Williamsburg by Lord Botetot, who was the, the royal governor at the time. Um, so this is pre-revolution. And um, they enjoyed it so much that when they returned to Mount Vernon, they immediately purchased a cream machine for making, or a, a I'm going to forget the quote, but it's basically a, a machine for making ice cream. Um, and what that is, is a sorbetier. And that was a copper, a, a, a tall, thin um, copper canister with a lid. And copper transfers temperatures, whether it's heat or cold, very well. And um, so the, the you know, you put that, that copper canister into a bucket of ice, you, you sprinkle um, rock salt in between the layers of ice, and then you twirl it, you, you, you turn it, and that helps transfer the cold, and then you stir periodically. Um, 18th century ice cream recipes, some of them are, um, you know, custard based, a lot of them are custard based, uh, some of them are just the, the cream and the, the um, flavoring, and then, you know, there's no custard involved. Um, 
in our, we actually demonstrate ice cream making here at Mount Vernon, typically in, in May and or June. Um, we have found that the custard based ones do tend to freeze much, e much more easily here at Mount Vernon. Um, and of course, where would they be getting the ice? Uh, on the left, we have a, a picture of the ice house that was here at Mount Vernon. Um, ice houses were very expensive we uh, to build. You have to have good insulation. You can see that this one's actually built into a hillside. Um, and so the, the earth is providing most of the insulation. Um, the ice would be collected in the um, in the winter, and we have records of Washington ordering enslaved people uh, to go out, not so much to the Potomac, but to the smaller tributaries, the little streams that were on the property, and cut ice, and then they would carry it back in carts, and they would store it in the ice house, and they would cover it with burlap, and then use straw or sawdust as insulation. And it seems like the ice typically stuck around until um, late June, early July, um, here at Mount Vernon. Uh, so certainly not all year long, but it, it would go into the summer. Um, the next image you see is us making ice cream. To the, the right of that, we actually have a piece from Mount Vernon's collection um, that shows you how ice, one way that ice cream might be served. Um, so there's that pot. And what, what you can't see is on the inside of the pot, um, there's a lower chamber, which you would fill with ice. And then there's this bowl that you would put on top of that. And that's where the ice cream would go. And then the lid would go on top. And you can see that that lid has this deep um, lip. And that allows you to put ice on top as well. And so you could carry your ice cream to the table um, and serve it up without having it melt. Uh, and then on the far right, you we have a, an 18th century um, recipe for ice cream in dining with the Washingtons, and this is the result. Um, many ice cream flavors in the 18th century were fruit-based. Um, they also had vanilla, chocolate, um, coconut, ginger, uh, you know, lots of different things. And then some more surprising flavors as well. Um, savory ice creams did exist back then. Um, Apparently, Tolly Madison's favorite ice cream was oyster ice cream. Um, and if you're going, ew, uh, don't think of it as a dessert. Think of it as a, an unsweetened, it, it would be almost like a, a frozen sort of oyster chowder um, served more like a canapé. Um, I know that still doesn't convince a lot of our visitors, uh, but <laughs> in terms of it being tasty, but you know, um, I, I think there would be a place for that. And certainly it, it would be a way of showing off that you had the ability to obtain ice in the summertime. And of course, the ingredients themselves, dairy and sugar, uh, were quite expensive as well. Um, and we do have records of the Washington serving ice cream and lemonade um, during the weekly levies that, that, that Martha Washington hosted during the presidency. Um, so that covers some of the, the things that the Washington family would have been eating. Um, let's turn now to the enslaved community. Um, the summertime would be a time of bounty for them as well. Uh, they wouldn't have had access to as many preservation techniques as the Washingtons, um, but they would have had quite a few foods coming available this time of year. Um, and particularly, uh, there would be a lot of foods that, that had originally come from Africa. Um, so for example, okra, we know that they were growing okra here at Mount Vernon. Um, okra is a, a native of Africa. And I've, I've seen some references that say um, by, by the 1750s or 60s, um, okra had been adopted so widely by the white community as well, um, that it really grew anywhere that the climate would allow throughout the East Coast um, here in the United States. Uh, so that's certainly a crop that the enslaved people would have been eating. Um, black eyed peas are another great example of an African crop that came to the Americas with the slave trade. Um, the enslaved people would have been growing these crops in their own uh, truck patches or, or, or family gardens. Uh, Washington is providing rations to the enslaved people of cornmeal and salted fish. Um, that is not enough to get by on. And so uh, the enslaved people here did keep gardens to, to supplement what he was providing. Um, and 
we have both written evidence of that because we we have we have records of Washington paying them for produce that they grew on their own, uh, and we have archaeological evidence of that as well, including beans. Um, though I don't don't know if we know the exact variety of bean, if we know that they were, you know, definitely black eyed peas, um, but most likely that is something that was available here to the enslaved community. Um, one of the interesting things about the gardens of the enslaved people is that um, they would have shown, uh, you know, the, the enslaved community is really where you see the, 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 the melting pot, the beginning of the blending of European, African, and indigenous American food traditions that became the uniquely American style of cooking. Um, and so in the, the gardens of the enslaved, there almost certainly would have been um, European crops. Here we have collard greens. Now, the, the traditional Southern style of greens that we are familiar with today, that is a cooking technique that originated in Africa where you're using a small amount of meat or, or fish um, and cooking it with greens you know, for a long time to create this very nutritious, um, you know, brothy uh, green um, and, and with the pot liquor as, as a, a very prominent part of that, very nutritious, very prominent part of that. Um, but the specific vegetables that they're using to create greens change in America. And so you start to see more European greens like collards, um, like kale being, being consumed by the enslaved, uh, cabbage as well. Um, and then you also see new world crops in the gardens of the enslaved people. Um, so tomatoes and peppers have this fascinating history. They originated in Central and South America. Um, they were some of the crops that returned to Europe and to Africa um, with some of the, the earliest Colombian expeditions. Now in, in Europe, um, they were rejected initially, at least as food. Um, people were growing tomatoes, but they grew them ornamentally. They thought that they were very pretty. Um, and the reason that, that tomatoes and peppers would have been rejected, um, potatoes also fall into this category. Um, the reason that, that, they, that Europeans would have rejected them is that all of these crops are part of the nightshade family. And all of the nightshades that are native to Europe are poisonous. And so it's not until the 18th century um, that European chefs start to experiment with these vegetables um, and, and realize that they are okay to eat. Um, so Thomas Jefferson, for example, there's a French chef who starts, um, who creates a trend. He starts cooking tomatoes in, in the, the 1780s. Um, and Thomas Jefferson is introduced to that in France. Um, and then he comes back to America and, and starts this, um, this sort of PR campaign where he calls tomatoes love apples um, as a way of trying to get people to eat them and, and make them seem okay. Um, but what's fascinating is that in Africa, that prejudice, that, that initial prejudice did not exist. Um, and so remember the Colombian uh, expeditions are happening in the 1490s. And so these crops are adopted in Africa almost right away. And so they are part of the food tradition for a little over 100 years, you know, 1619 before um, slavery comes to Virginia. And so those crops are already part of the African food tradition by that point. And so they, they originate in Central and South America, they travel over to Africa. And when, the, when they come back to North America, they're actually coming with the slave trade. Um, and so here at Mount Vernon, um, we don't think that, that the Washingtons would have been eating tomatoes. Um, we do think that they were eating peppers. Uh, Washington makes several references to cayennes, um, but these are crops that, that were really introduced by the enslaved community. Um, so that's pretty much it for, uh, for my focus on summer eating. Um, to kind of summarize, um, summer would have been a time of incredible bounty, um, which would have meant this explosion of fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly the, the stone fruits and berries um, on the table of the Washingtons. Um, it also would have been a time of a huge amount of work for um, 
for Dahl, for Lucy, for the, uh, you know, the enslaved chefs here at Mount Vernon, for Hercules, um, because they would have borne the burden of preserving all of those food using pickling primarily and um, sweet preserves for fruit. Um, the, the Washingtons enjoyed all kinds of chilled desserts, um, including jellies and ice creams. And then the enslaved community would have been enjoying the bounty of their own gardens, um, which included this incredible variety of crops. Um, so that's it, and I hope that you enjoyed uh, this this presentation, and I hope to see you again for our discussion of 